Okay, so we're going to go back to the two things I'm going to talk about are the process of asking for money, which is a natural extension of the exercise that we did last week. And the other element that I'm going to talk about, as I said, is negotiation techniques. Uh, where am I best to stand for the... You're picking the screen up as well as me, or... Anyway. <laughs> so the, the solicitation process, there are, a number, there are a number of different ways that this can be presented. Um, this particular one is coming out of uh, an introduction to marketing course that I've taught many times at Concordia. But I'm going to talk about it in the context of, of fundraising specifically. The first step in the prospect, uh, first step in the process is prospecting and qualifying. Now we've talked about this already. This is where research comes in. In order to make sure that you are specifically identifying people who have the three qualities that all donors must have in order for them to make a gift. Remember what those three are? Yeah, okay, ability to give. That's ability, which is the middle letter. Linkage. Linkage, which means what? Uh, not so much a connection to the organization that could be an issue, but there's a more specific thing that you're looking for with regard to linkage. Uh, the connection to the cause isn't, that's not linkage. That's the third end. Personal uh, linkage? Sorry? Personal linkage? Like, like, you're, you're close, you're on the right track there. Is it Okay. okay, interest is the third element. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got affinity, linkage, and interest are the three things. Mm -hmm. So going back to linkage, what are we looking for with linkage? The connection. Yeah. Connection between the cause and the donor? Uh, maybe between the cause and the donor, within but there's a more important connection. Sorry? With individual within Much closer. The connection between the donor and what whatever he's contributing, whatever he's contributing. Mm -hmm. No, no, you're a little cooler. The connection between the donor and the person who's asking him the money. Right, that's what it is. The connection between the cause and the donor. The key yeah. element to linkage is the connection between the donor and whoever is asking the donor for money. Okay. That is the thing that we really want to have solidly established. The connection between the donor and the organization and the, their affinity for the cause, um, that's interest, which we also need to have. So all three of those need to be present. That's what we mean when we talk about qualifying a prospect. So only a small number of prospects are, necessary, are going to become donors. Most of the people that we ask for money, we anticipate that most of them are going to say no. So we need to have many more prospects than the number of gifts we need. So in the, prop, in the preparatory phase, we want to make sure that we're identifying a lot of people, uh, you know, that we take the necessary time to really understand who we're going to be approaching before we start approaching them. Because if we don't, we run the risk of you know, missing out on a lot of money that we might be able to get if we knew these people better, or wasting a lot of time talking to people that never should have been um, high priority prospects in the first place. Second element is the pre-approach. Um, so now, now that we've identified who we want to get to and we have a sense of what qualifies them as prospects, the next thing we want to do is start gathering research, gathering information about them in order to get a more complete three-dimensional picture of who these prospects are. Uh, which takes us to the approach itself. So the first, the first time we encounter the respective donor. Um, so this will go into several critical things, but the most important one, and throughout the entire process, the single most important element of the solicitation process is shutting up and listening. Mm -hmm. Asking questions that are going to, asking open-ended questions that are going to elicit information that, so that you can continue to build your 
uh, your proposal uh, tailored to their specific interests. So as you continue to move on, presentation and demonstration. In the previous, in the previous step, we were just, in, it's an initial getting to know you meeting. Now we're getting to the point where we're actually talking about what the organization does. Um, even here though, you're still needing to concentrate on asking good questions and listening to responses. So yes, you need to talk about the cause and what it is that you're raising the money for, otherwise they're not going to know about it. But what you're really looking to, ha to come out of the meeting with is a clear sense of what their reaction is to that information so that you can then, uh, so you can then adjust any follow-up communication with them so, such that it's tailored to what they're really interested in. Um, yeah, I mentioned that technology can help or get in the way. Uh, you know, a lot of organizations, for instance, will make videos and people will, you know, in the olden days, we used to actually shoot them on videotape and, you know, bring a, and, you know, and ask to have a video cassette recorder and a TV available when meeting a prospect or maybe even sending them the video in advance. Today we're just as likely to have the video, you know, electronically on, you know, on a tablet or a cell phone. But even at that, you're, when you're showing a, te you know, a technological tool like that, you're breaking the natural flow of a conversation. So the really critical thing, if you're going to use video at all, uh, make them really short. And when I say really short, I mean like 30 seconds, a minute tops. But you know, if you go in with like a seven minute video, um, that's something you could have sent in advance. It's something you can send as a follow up. It can be a really good follow up to send. If you've got somebody who has demonstrated sufficient interest that they'd be willing to sit through seven minutes of video. That's a really, really long video. Uh, but generally speaking, you want to keep video content short, and especially when you're in a solicitation meeting, generally I advise either not using it or using something really short and that is there for a strategic purpose. So for instance, you might go in with a 30 second video testimonial from somebody who's a beneficiary of the cause. That's something that can have a real impact. Or something that, you know, or uh, similarly a testimonial from some famous individual who is supporting the cause to, you know, to, to emphasize the, you know, who is, you know, who's backing up this cause. You want to be prepared to handle any kind of objections that are going to come up. Frequently in campaigns, I'll put together, um, you know, what is essentially a frequently asked questions list of potential objections that we're likely to encounter along with appropriate responses to those. If we know that certain kinds of questions are, are going to come up, we want to make sure that volunteers, because we really want the volunteers to be the ones asking for money, we want to make sure that they're prepared in advance with canned answers to those questions so they're not going to get tripped up. Uh, So yeah, there are various reasons why prospects might object. Um, in some cases, it may be because their their interest in the cause hasn't been fully developed. Um, in some cases, it may be because they just want more information. Um, but sometimes it's just a negotiating tactic, and you need to be alert to that. That sometimes they're they're just going to try to trip you up or find ways that they can avoid having to make a decision. Um, or to make a decision to give as much as you're asking for. You avoid getting objections in general by focusing the prospect's interest, by focusing the prospect's attention on, on their own philanthropic vision, on what they want to accomplish. This is why uh, when we, you know, when we start out, well actually I've skipped through, I'm going to I'm going to skip back to something to explain what it is that we're, we're trying to accomplish in this. Because I don't think I showed this. Uh, to show you the important, and it actually fits right into This is the point where it fits in. Uh, I want you to take a look at this next slide. Okay? And I want you to pay attention to what the slide is telling you to do and pay attention to what you're thinking about as you see this slide. And 
follow the instructions on the screen. Everybody got that? What are you thinking of? <laughs> yeah, an elephant. The main you're thinking of an elephant. If you're not thinking of an elephant, you're thinking, I gotta think of something that's not an elephant. Oh no, I'm thinking of an elephant. Oh, I'm not thinking of an elephant. <laughs> right? If I tell you don't think of an elephant, the only thing you can think of is an elephant. That's the only that's all they get. We're, we're wired that way. It's a natural tendency. Um, this is actually the title of a really good book by George Lakoff, um, who was analyzing actually American election campaigns and talked about the importance of focusing the attention of prospects. And that's really the, the key message here, is that in order to succeed in any kind of negotiation, what you want to be doing is focusing the attention of the individual to whom you're speaking. So your task in any kind of a solicitation scenario is keep them focused on accomplishing their philanthropic vision. It's all about how, what, how they want to change the world to make it a better place. You want to keep shifting them back to that, particularly if they, as will likely be their tendency, if they continually want to keep coming back to talking about um, the amount of money that you're asking for. You don't want to be butting heads over amounts of money. You want to be focusing on how you can, how you are a conduit to accomplish their philanthropic vision. So always bring a supply of, of, of elephants to your meetings with prospects. Meaning, be prepared with subjects to redirect their attention. Uh, and, and now we will continue with our regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> So, yeah. Can you give us examples of philanthropic visions? Like our day might have, what visions that they might have? Okay, well, let me put the question to you. How many of you have made a donation to charity in the last six months? Pretty good. Okay. What did you give to and why? What was it, what was it about a cause that made you willing to give away your money for it. Was for a make a wish foundation about children who were like no hope for life at the end and to provide to help them realize their dream and put their activity in it. So to me that was close to my heart thinking about those parents and those children who will not have a chance to live any longer in their okay. final phases. So it's close to my heart so that's why I gave Okay. I have a healthy, I have healthy children, and I cannot think for a minute that it would like the life would be ending anytime soon. So, okay. I feel which one that information. Very good. Somebody else? What other? What else has, has motivated your philanthropic giving? You have your hand up. Uh, yeah, it was uh, a friend of mine. So he made the yeah the organization. So. That's why I, I felt like supporting Okay, so, so you were giving specifically because of the relationship with the person who was asking you for money? Yeah. But was it a cause that you would have considered supporting anyone? Not really, no. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. <laughs> okay, so that's a good illustration of how a personal relationship in and of itself can lead somebody to make a gift. But what I want to concentrate on here is Gifts that you made that in some way represented you trying to accomplish something that is your own philanthropic motivation. For example, I can't get into a cause. Um, I give money for cause because of the earthquake victims in Haiti. Um, okay. Like we have an abundance of um, stuff here. And I thought I couldn't think that they were, they were still people living in makeshift homes since it has to be earthquake. And I, I donated them to the people who were going back to help rebuild. Okay. Are you in a position where you would be able to fly to Haiti yourself to yes. deliver it? If I was able to volunteer my time, yes. Yeah. Are you able to? Is this no, something you have time to do? Well, probably just on vacation. 
haven't done it yet. Uh, yeah, not on a day to day. My point being that mm -hmm. giving money to people who were able to go to Haiti and yes. do that mm -hmm. makes more like I donated when the Haitian earthquakes happened, and I don't anticipate ever going to Haiti. Uh, maybe no. someday, but I don't think so. But, but it's still ongoing. But I'm happy to know that there were people that are prepared to go to Haiti and deliver that kind of aid. And so I'm willing to give money to the organizations that do that in lieu of going myself. Because I do have, you know, because part of my philanthropic vision is providing aid to people in desperate need. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, it goes with exactly what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Do, do you see now, are you getting a sense of what, what I mean when I'm talking about philanthropic vision? The vision, I mean as a vision, it's not as a cause. Maybe just to help people or to, um, I mean, in the, for example, if, if my foundation is supporting kids, maybe you don't have an interest to support kids, right? I shouldn't approach you. Or... Yeah, you shouldn't, yeah, right. If you're... If you are soliciting on behalf of an organization that works with children yes. and you've done your research and realized that you know, a certain individual that has a lot of money doesn't give to you know, youth-related causes, they shouldn't even be on your prospect list. So this is, <coughs> so this, is part of the, this is part of the research that you're doing in the first yes. place. But if you are approaching somebody that has never supported your cause before but has been known to support children's causes, getting them to talk about what motivated them to give to other children's causes will give you an idea of how to frame talking about your cause in a way that will make it appealing to them as well. According to their, According to their philanthropic vision, exactly. Okay? So, the actual ask, as I told you last time, uh, usually we try to frame the ask in an open-ended way. You don't want to ask, you want to avoid using yes/no questions in the solicitation in all circumstances, because what you're trying to do is elicit responses from the other person. And even the ask um, should be phrased along the lines of, "What would you think about making a contribution of ten thousand dollars to this campaign? What would you think about, or how would you feel about?" The answers to those questions are not yes or no. It's going to be, you know some kind of an emotion, some kind of a response. There's something more to it than just a yes or a no. Um, another critical thing, though, is that once you've said that, once you've put that ask in front of them, the next thing you should say is absolutely nothing. After you've made the ask, after you've put the number in front of them, shut up. The next person to talk has to be the prospect not you. Don't make the, the cardinal error of putting a number in front of somebody. What would you think about making a contribution of $10,000? But if that's too much for you, you know, there is this fear that if there's an awkward silence that somehow maybe I've done something to offend them, maybe I've, you know, and, and to, to try to jump in and, and you know, avoid, you know, avoid awkwardness somehow. No. Embrace the awkwardness. Learn to love silence. Because that silence is a, it's a moment when they, yeah, it's kind of awkward. It's awkward for them too. But they're thinking about that number and they know that they have to say something and they may be sitting there thinking, I hope they're coming in with something else along the lines of, you know, I hope they're going to say the magic words, but anything you're willing to give is okay. Don't ever say that, because that is not true, okay? Anything you want to give is not okay. I want you to give the amount that, I want you to think about the amount that I've asked you for. And if what you're thinking about is anything other than that number, unless it's greater than that number, which it shouldn't be if you've done good research, uh, I don't want you thinking about those smaller numbers. I want you thinking about the number I asked you for. So... Let them come back with a response at that point. That's critically important in the solicitation field. It is probably the single most important piece of information that I want you to remember about solicitations. Is when you ask for them, always ask for a specific amount, always. If you ask for a range, uh, you know, if you ask somebody, you know, what would you think about giving 5000 to $10,000? How much money did you just ask for? 
$5,000. If you're asking for a range, you ask for the low end of the range. So just ask for the amount that you want. If what you want is $10,000, ask for $10,000. Second thing is, when you put that number in front of them, shut up. They have to be the next one to talk. And the response is likely, the most likely responses you're going to get are things along the lines of, uh, that's a lot more than I was thinking of giving, which is kind of what I want to hear, is that I've asked them for something that's, you know, a little beyond what, they're, what they were thinking of, in which case I just re-ask the question, you know, what would you, think about, what would you think about making a donation of that level? Because that's what I really want to know. Yeah, it's a lot more than you were expecting, that doesn't surprise me, but if they're not coming back and saying, that's more than I can afford. If you've done your research well, they shouldn't come back saying that's more than I can afford. They may say that's more than I was expecting you to ask for or more than I was anticipating giving to this particular cause. Then you're in a position where you can start steering them back towards their vision and you know, towards the impact that they can have. So, you know, and I will always come back to that saying, no, I never come down, I don't come down from that number right off the bat. In fact, I prefer to let them come down for the number when they're, when they're comfortable to do so, uh, rather than I, I really try to stick with the number that I've asked for. And it's okay if there's no decision on the spot. Because the other thing you want to anticipate is that it may be that it's going to take further time to get them to that point, in which case you can ask the question, what would, what would bring up your, com your comfort level with a gift of that amount? What would you need to see happen in order for you to be comfortable giving at that level? You know, what kind of a difference would you need to make? Those are the kinds of questions that are getting them to focus on their vision and what they can accomplish rather than focusing on the amount of money, which is what you don't want them focusing on. You want them to be focusing on how they can make a difference. Uh, yeah, fear of rejection makes this step the most difficult. Uh, but don't make light of it. Don't ever, another thing. Don't ever, ever, ever apologize for asking people for money. I see that a lot, too. No, I'm sorry, but you know, I've got to do this. What, what would you think about giving? No, I'm not sorry about asking you for money. I feel really good about this cause. I feel really motivated by this cause. I'm a donor to this cause myself, by the way. Critically important. Never send a volunteer out to ask for money until they've made their own gift. And I have seen this consistently over 30 years canvassers who have not made their own donations are, are always less effective than those who have. Yeah. Even if it's a, what they call a small donation? Like Ideally, you should have volunteers who are asking others for money at or below the level that they personally gave. Okay. Like you want the canvasser to be a peer of the person that they're talking to, but at a minimum, you know, if it's somebody that maybe, you know, maybe it's somebody who's a staff member of the organization and doesn't have the same kind of financial means, at a minimum I want them to have made a gift that is um, appropriate for their income level so that they feel that they've made a donation that is impacting them in a way similar to the amount that they're asking is going to impact the person that they're asking for money. Is that clear enough? Um, but, in, but, but that's critical because you want to make sure that they feel comfortable, that the canvasser feels comfortable pushing a person to make that gift. Um, yeah, so don't be apologetic. There's no apology to be made. This is a good cause. You're a philanthropic person. You give to good causes. I know this. I've done the research. I've seen, and you've talked to me about it. So this is the kind of cause that you would normally be supporting. So I'm not apologizing for asking you to do something that you have already done in other circumstances. That I know, I know this is something you do. And I am, I am doing you a favor by giving you an opportunity to realize your philanthropic vision by contributing to this great project. You don't want to put it in exactly those words. <laughs> not, but, that is, but that's got to be the spirit in which you're going into the, the encounter. That what you're doing is you're giving them an opportunity to realize their own philanthropic vision by contributing to this great project that is going to make exactly the kind of philanthropic change that they want to make in the world. You've got to, you've got to pitch it such that it's the greatest thing in the world for them to be having the opportunity to give to this cause.
The follow-up at the end, as you reach the end of a solicitation meeting, and particularly that key meeting where you're putting the number in front of them, you want to uh, you want to be ensuring that you you want to keep control of what's going to happen next. Oftentimes, what I will do in this circumstance is say that you know I understand you need some time to think about it. Um, what would you think about you know what, what would you think if I were to give you a call in you know in three days time? Uh, or actually, what I really like to use is what I call the dressing the three-year-old strategy. Anybody who's a parent who has had a three-year-old child, if you say to a three-year-old child in the morning, wear this to school today, what is their instantaneous response going to be? No. 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 If you say to a three-year-old child, pick out something to wear, then you don't know what the hell they're going to put on. Because they're three-year-olds, and they don't have, you know, they don't have the same command of fashion, um, you know, and the same sort of self-awareness that adult humans have. So you don't want to do that. So instead, you use the dressing the three-year-old strategy. Would you rather wear this or this? Now, the three-year-old's in control, she thinks, because she gets to choose which one she's going to go with. Where this comes into play in this circumstance is that I will say to somebody, would it be better for you if I gave you a call on Thursday afternoon or Friday afternoon? Because <laughs> now it's a choice between those of you know, I've got some time on Thursday and Friday afternoon when I, can, when I can drop by to see you or when I can give you a call. Which of those is better for you? Because now you are actually giving them a closed-end question, but it's not a yes-no, it's, it's an either-or. And it's an either-or where you know that you're going to have an opportunity to interact with them. If they come back with, uh, well, I'll just get in touch with you when I can, you've got to be coming back with, listen, I, I understand that, that you need to have the time to think about this. Um, would it be okay if I called you on, if, you know, if Thursday and Friday doesn't work for you, is it okay if I call you on Monday? Would that give you enough time? Because I'm going to keep coming back at them. When, when can I get back to you? Because I need... We need decisions here. We, you know, we're on a time frame as well. I understand that this may be a tough decision. It may take you some time. But we're on a time frame as well. And I, you know, I really I need to, you know, you don't want this dragging out forever. I don't want this dragging out forever. Let's, let's find a time when we think we can come to an agreement. And even if you don't have a decision by Friday afternoon, that's okay. I'll just touch base with you to see if you have any other questions. And... See when I can get to you after that. But it keeps the control of the process in your hands, which is critically important. Um, another part of the follow-up is once somebody has made a gift, first of all, once somebody has made a gift, you want to give very quick acknowledgement. I try for, you know, my time frame is 48 hours for response. And depending on the size of the gift, uh, the bigger the gift, the more personalized the, the response. So if it's a really high-end gift, I phone them. In fact, I will have the executive director or the chairman phone them to thank them. A little lower than that, major gift level, handwritten card. People don't expect to see handwritten cards anymore. So when they get them, that's a surprise. And, and it's a good surprise. That will make them, or they will be happy people with that. At the lowest end, you're at least going to be sending out probably a receipt. But even if you're going to be sending out just, you know, a fairly standardized thank you letter with the receipt, I still recommend personalizing all of those. Or just, you know, put a little handwritten note on the thing. It's even better, post-it notes. You want to guarantee that people are going to pay attention to something that they're receiving in the mail? Stick a post-it note on it. For some bizarre reason, even if a post-it note is put on a solicitation piece with nothing written on it, people will still read, the like, even if they think it was a mistake that the post-it note appeared there, they'll still be more likely to read the content than if it was just standard. If it's a corporation, do you address a letter to the person that you have a personal contact with, or how? Um... You address, yeah, you are going to, you always think, yeah, if you went and solicited somebody personally, so let's say that your campaign chairman met with the chief executive officer of the company, the, the donation itself came in the mail in the form of a letter from the company's donations officer. You're going to send the formal thank you to the donations officer, but you're going to have your chairman personally communicate with the CEO that they talked to. 
You know, you're always going to go for the most personal level of thanks that you possibly can. My wife will be in to, to talk about that in a few classes. She's going to be talking about the specifics of donor recognition and stewardship. Okay? The other thing to keep in mind is that the best canvassers are the ones who have already given because they don't feel apologetic at all about asking other people to give to the cause. They've already put their money in and they want to see everybody else that thinks as they do joining. So think in terms of, as you're in the process of thanking donors, you know, it's worthwhile to go in and meet with them and say, listen, are there any of these prospects that you might be able to help us with? Now that you've made your own gift, you know, are there any of these people that you know that you might be able to put in a good word with or help us out with, or perhaps even, you know, we've got several prospects that we haven't, we haven't got contacts with yet. Do you know any of these people? Might you be able to open doors for us? Because once somebody has made that initial gift, their likelihood of agreeing to do further things is greatly enhanced. Another question, political um, uh, sponsorship. If, so, to you, uh, you address the, the, the letter to the deputy? Thank them for hours if you receive. So, so is the sponsorship from? It's not a sponsorship, but um, can I say that it's a sponsorship? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, what is the one that is sponsored for an activity? We don't like a conclusion. Yeah, don't care. Like, um, okay, so you're so you're asking if you're getting a donation yeah. from a political representative, yes. somebody who is a member of the National Assembly, member of Parliament, to a city yeah. councillor. You thank them personally? Yeah, or you and thank, people sometimes can be in touch with um, the Centre de Responsabilité de la Communautaire. You always, always thank the person with whom you have the most personal relationship. You can thank many people. Yeah. Well, that's one thing to keep in mind. You can't say thank you too many times. In fact, the rule of thumb is that any, any gift, within a year after a gift, you should be thanking them seven times. Now, those thanks don't necessarily have to be thank you letters. It could be providing information. It could be in, you know, calling up to invite them to an event. You can do multiple thank yous. And in that kind of a circumstance, you are always going to send a formal thank you to the elected representative. They always get a formal thank you. Um, they may get an informal thank you as well if you have a personal relationship with them. Uh, you know, I've got certain politicians that I know personally that if I were to get a donation from their office, I would pick up the phone and give them a call and say thanks. Yeah. Uh, and you also thank whatever staff of theirs were involved. Because particularly politics, and I don't talk much about political giving in this course, because that's not really philanthropic, but when you're dealing with, with political entities, you, you always want to provide tender, loving care to the people who work for elected officials. Mm -hmm. Because they will be as nice to you as you are willing to be nice to them. And so, and they spend a lot of their time, political attachés spend a lot of their time listening to people complain. So they tend to be very, very receptive to hearing from people who are calling to say thank you. And that will make them more receptive the next time you need to ask them for money. And there will always be a next time. Okay? So, any, any last questions on process? Okay. The next bit that I'm going to do... Uh, this is the presentation that I have given the most frequently in professional conferences. And these are the actual slides that I use to do that. I just, I've got this standard presentation on negotiation that I've done numerous times. Uh, and the next, so this next bit is actually, is that actual presentation as I've given it. And this is the last thing I'm going to be talking about with regards to negotiation before we go on to taking a look at evaluation. So psychology of persuasion is built on work by Dr. Robert Cialdini. He's a psychologist from Arizona State University in Phoenix. And what Cialdini did was what's called meta-research or meta-analysis, where he was looking at numerous studies that had been done, numerous um, scientific studies that had been done on the subject of persuasion in order to try and find common threads. Find what are, you know, what are the common threads that make a message more persuasive? And coming out of that, he identified six key tools that will tend to make any communication carry more weight. 
Those are social proof, liking, reciprocity, scarcity, authority, and consistency. I'm going to talk about each one of them. You will want to remember these, and all six of them. There is an article by Bob Cialdini in the course pack. Um, for some reason, in the article, this is the only article I know of that he's written, where he has applied his own work to philanthropy, to charity. Um, although I have heard him, I have you know, attended one of his workshops that was sponsored by the Association of Fundraising Professionals. He's another one of these people that if you get the opportunity to go to a workshop led by Dr. Robert Cialdini, jump at it. He's really, really good. Uh, but he has six tools. I expect you to know all six. For some reason in the article uh, that you got in the course pack, he only talks about four of them. And he left out two. And I don't know why he left them out, but I expect you to know all of them. And in order to ensure that you do, on the website, you have, in addition to my slides, you also have the handout from when I did this presentation. I think it's the version from Baltimore. Uh, anyways, from one, of the, from one of the AFP conferences where I did this presentation, I've provided you with my handout, so you've got you know, additional information. There's also um, added stuff, because in the presentation that I do, I also go into... Um, what's called shadow negotiation, you're not responsible for that part. Um, although it is in the slides, I'm not going to be covering it in class, um, so I'm not going to expect you to go into that. But if you want some really good tips on how to be better at asking people for money, um, including how to ask spouses for money, if that's something that you may be involved in, or having to ask bosses for money, which you'll undoubtedly have to do at some point, um, these tools are not for philanthropy, they're for literally everything. Um, okay, so number one tool, social proof. Probably the most powerful of all of them. We tend to do what other people are doing. The classic research on this um, involved, classic psychological research, involved having a few people who were working for the researcher stand on a street corner and look up. And in a matter of relatively little time, you will have lots of other people that will gather to look up. And the funny thing is, if you ask them what they are looking at, they will be able to tell you. Even though the people that were initially standing looking up weren't looking at anything in particular. But because everybody's sort of standing and looking up, they will collectively figure out what it is that they're looking at. Um, and, you know, it's kind of funny that way. Because we tend to do stuff that other people do. In fundraising, this is why we solicit for the biggest gifts first. Because that sends a message. Because you want other donors to be looking at what those donors did and saying, oh, if others are giving at that level, I guess maybe I should be thinking about giving at that kind of a level. Right? Social proof. That's also why you want to talk about how much money has been raised to date, how many people have contributed already to the cause. All of these things are going to tend to lead people to be more receptive to your, to your message. Second is liking. We tend to do stuff for people we like. This is why generations of women have agreed to wear dresses that look like this because their friends happen to be getting married. I always get a bit of a chuckle out of that one. But when I was at a conference in Baltimore a few years ago, uh, between sessions I was walking around Baltimore Harbor just you know, being a tourist and happened to run across this. This is my own photo. Now, what you can't tell from this photo is that it was really cold that day. This was in March in Baltimore. There was a cold wind. I was wearing a polar fleece under a leather jacket. Like, I was bundled up. I'm looking at these people, and like you can't see it, but the, the extra bridesmaids over here, they were all huddled together, and they were jumping up and down for warmth because it was that cold. You don't, you know, meantime, these you know, women that are getting their picture taken are trying to look like they're totally cool with this, right? But you don't do this for people you don't like. If you like somebody, you're going to be willing to go out of your way. You're going to be willing to... You know, maybe put your dignity on the line to some degree. Uh, it makes a difference to what you're willing to do. And the same thing goes with fundraising. You want to put yourself in a position where the 
the prospective donors that you're meeting with feel an affinity towards you personally. Now again, there are some concrete things that you can do to encourage that. Um, on a simple level, you know, stuff like compliment, you know, complimenting them. You want to be ethical about this, and you, know, you don't want to you know, say that's a really beautiful tie when in fact you think it's hideous. Um, but at the same time, you, know, you want to find some you know, nice things about them to say. More importantly, you really want to get people to like you? Give them an opportunity to talk about their favorite subject. That favorite subject is themselves. As soon as you ask people questions about themselves, about their own lives, about their own accomplishments, their natural tendency is to feel a greater sense of affinity towards you because, because you're showing an interest in the thing they love the most, the thing that they see in the mirror every morning. Okay? You let people talk about themselves and they are going to tend to feel better towards you. Third tool is reciprocity. We tend to repay what others have done for us, which we all learned long ago in kindergarten. We all learned how to share. And that's basically where recipro what reciprocity is all about. It's I do something for you, so you do something for me. Now, on a basic level, what we, the way we can use this is by uh, talking about what the cause has done for them or for people they care about, um, whether it's people they know personally or not. So if you're talking to somebody about giving to, um, you know, to Haitian earthquake relief, um, being able to talk about how this cause has made a difference to other people in need um, could suggest that they have a certain responsibility themselves to do something to, to contribute towards that. Now, Cialdini also talks about a more complex application of this. Where, and it comes back to the way we tend to negotiate when we're haggling. You know, when you're haggling over something. We don't, we don't do a lot of that in, in North America. We tend to pay what's on the price tag. But in other cultures, haggling is expected. Like, you're considered to be a really stupid mark if you pay the amount of money that's marked on the article that you, know, you were offered for sale. You know, some, we, we get used to that. And that is actually an exercise in reciprocity. Because what you're doing is you're making an offer at a certain level. They're giving a counter offer at a lower level. If you were willing to come down slightly from your initial level, effectively, you've just given something to the other party. And it is now their responsibility to give something back to you. Now, I don't recommend in a solicitation getting into you know, a haggling back and forth over numbers. But by finding things that you can offer to, to kind of sweeten the deal in one way or another, maybe you're able to offer some kind of special access to, uh, you know, to an exhibition if it's an art type, um, you know, so some kind of art, artistic cause. Um, maybe it's some kind of a, you know, special signed copy of a book that's associated with the cause. Like something that you can offer. If you're able to offer something additional, then they are, there's an expectation on their part, there will be an expectation, a natural expectation on their part, they should do something in return for that. Okay? So that's reciprocity, that's number three. Number four is scarcity. This is one of my favorites. We tend to find things more valuable when they're less available. If something is rare, it has a higher price. Here's an example. These look good. They cost $2,000 per kilogram. These are, oops, come to that in a second. These are Matsutake mushrooms. Um, there are, I've got the statistics on the screen here. Yeah, there are only a thousand tons of these produced each year in Japan. And they are a delicacy, and as you see, these suckers cost $2,000 a kilogram. I assume they're delicious. I wouldn't know. I can't afford them. <laughs> but I know that the reason they're that expensive is that there are very few of them. And presumably, they're also tasty. I mean, if they tasted horrible, no matter how many they produce, nobody would eat them. But the thing is, to the extent that you can make a, your offer, and you're making an offer to somebody, and you're asking them for money, you're basically offering them an opportunity. The, the more you can make that offer appear scarce, the more likely they are to find it, um, to, to find it appealing. So the way we play 
with scarcity in a, in a fundraising situation, one of the things that we can make scarce is something that we don't tend to think of as being, uh, as being malleable. And that's time. We tend to think of time as being fixed. You know, one second is one second no matter where you are. You know, five minutes takes exactly five minutes and it can never take less than five minutes. Like, time doesn't change. Except that it does. Time is a purely psychological construct. It's something we've kind of imposed on, on our reality in order to put a sense of that degree of control to it. It doesn't actually exist as a thing in and of itself. So we can, in fact, stretch it and compress it. And by compressing it, you, you increase the sense of urgency. One classic way that we compress time in a campaign situation, in a capital campaign, is by setting a date for a, for a public campaign launch. In capital campaigns, typically what we'll do is have start out with what's called the quiet phase of the campaign, where we're raising money from the internal constituency, the board of directors, the staff, uh, and the leadership donor, the prospective leadership donors, the top level donors. Once we've got all of that done, we're hoping that we're going to have, hoping, we're planning on having ideally 60 to 70 percent of the goal generated from that group. Then we have a public launch. Now the public launch is a bit of a misnomer. We're not really launching the campaign. The campaign is well underway. In fact, it's it's beyond its halfway point, ideally, by the time we do it. But it's an opportunity. It, we actually do that event specifically in order to compress time. We have put an artificial deadline on the leadership gift phase of the campaign. And we're able to say to people, if you make your donation by June the 21st, then we will be able to announce your gift at the campaign launch. Or maybe we'll be able to have you publicly present your gift at the campaign launch. And in any event, your gift will be included in the count, in the total that's announced at the campaign launch. So we've just taken time and compressed it. The, there's now a finite amount of time available in order to take advantage of that, uh, of that opportunity. And you can use that even in, um, you know, even in solicitation letters, you know, where you talk about you know, if you make your gift by such and such a date, um, and then maybe offer something, or that we need to have responses by such and such a date in order to and give a reason. This is also why so much fundraising happens in November and December every year in Canada, because all gifts that are made before December 31st can be included in the tax returns of the donors for you know the next round of, of tax returns the following April, which, let's face it, is when everybody does that. Um, so by doing that, so you're, you're using an artificial deadline created by the federal government, in that case, in order to, to compress time. So anything you can do to make, to, to offer, to, to create scarce resources that are going to be appealing to, to the donors will lead to an increased probability of their making a gift, and making a gift within a reasonable time frame. Number five is authority. We tend to defer to experts. And here, this is an example that uh, Cialdini gives in the article that you have in the course pack. Monterey Bay Aquarium puts out a publication called Seafood Watch. And in it, they tell you what kinds of seafood that, you, that, that is good to choose from an, an ecological, environmental standpoint, what kinds of things are reasonable alternatives, and what kinds of stuff you should not be eating if you are concerned about the planet. Right? Which is great. Establishes them as an authority on you know, safe seafood and, and the environment and ecology. But pay close attention. This is the example I've got up here. Northeast Consumer Guide. Where is Monterey Bay? Anybody know where Monterey Bay is? Seriously? Nope. Anybody care to take a guess? The States. <laughs> okay, it's in the United States. Yes, that will. That's a good start. I'll say in the West, just because this one says Northeast. Oh, gonna... Good guess. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually it's on the California coast. It's located between San Francisco and Los Angeles. 
which, yes, is on the west coast, definitely not the northeast. Monterey Bay Aquarium produces these guides for all regions of the United States. And what that does, first of all, it does, you know, protects the environment anywhere where there's seafood to be had, which is a primary concern. But a secondary concern, it means that they can be soliciting people literally anywhere in the United States and be able to demonstrate their authority, their expertise, in that area all across the country. They're able to talk about what they do as having implications not just in Monterey Bay, on the Pacific Coast, in the middle of California, but literally right across the entire country. And this is something that any organization can do. All organizations have got expertise within them. You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't exist if you didn't have some expertise in the area that you're dealing with. And social media now makes it much, much easier to demonstrate that expertise on an ongoing basis. Now, I'm going to talk in more detail about inbound marketing in a later class. But the key tool in, 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 in inbound marketing is the blog. It's a publica an informal publication that the organization produces on a regular basis, not simply to talk about itself, but to demonstrate its expertise. That is a far more valuable use of the blog than simply to talk about what you're doing and what your next event is. By creating content that, uh, that, is, that is going to be seen to be authoritative uh, and that is going to be useful to the readers, you are establishing your authority. And by establishing that authority, you are increasing the probability of getting gifts. Um, this is also why you want to be paying attention to who you might have among your staff and among your volunteers who may carry particular weight in, in a subject area that would be of interest to your donors. Um, you know, th this is why L'Orchestre Symphonique de Montréal has always got Kent Nagano front and center on all of their stuff. Because Kent Nagano is an internationally recognized uh, musical director. People all over the world know who he is, and we've got him here in Montreal. So we want to emphasize his authority. Okay? So by demonstrating your authority and by finding opportunities to demonstrate that authority, you're increasing the probability of getting gifts. Oh yeah, Seafood Watch, it's an app too, so you can use it pretty much anywhere. forgot I'd added that. The last of the six tools is consistency. We tend to behave in accordance with what we've done in the past. Now, this is a photo of, you may recognize this, I mean. Girls for the Cure. Anybody ever been involved in a few Girls for the Cure march? Anybody familiar with it? Not so. <laughs> Do you want to explain what it is? Just march up Mount Royal and raise money for breast cancer awareness. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all it's all private schools, isn't it? All private girls schools. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Independent schools for girls. So Miss Edgers and Miss Trams, Trafalgar, uh, the Study, Villa Maria. So all of these schools get together, and once a year, and they do this march, and they all have matching t-shirts to wear, and in doing this, they generate revenue for breast cancer research. Now, here's the point I want to make, though. These girls are all involved in a fundraising campaign. They're involved in raising money for charity. They are going to tend, we know this from research, that they are going to tend to be receptive to becoming volunteers and donors as adults. Because we know from research that if people have been volunteers as children, they are massively more likely to be volunteers for charitable causes as adults. And that's because of consistency. Because we see they are all going to see themselves as people who go out of their way to do good things for good causes. And, you know, in fact, I I know ECS really well. I worked there for a couple of years. Enya was there for 11 years. Uh, and, and I know that it's something that is heavily emphasized by the school. The, the, the idea of giving back to the community and philanthropically supporting the community, all of that. And a lot of schools are emphasizing that kind of thing today. Now, in general philanthropy, you want to be able to emphasize, to, to remind people of what they have done for you in the past. So if somebody, this is why it's so important to make, to make sure that you highlight when people have made a donation, 
that you highlight the fact that they are donors, that you are talking to them as people who have contributed to this cause in the past, so that they are reminded, so by, have, by reminding them, you're making it more likely that they are going to behave consistently with what they've done previously. Similarly, if you're approaching somebody for the first time, going in with some kind of a low-level request that is easy for them to say yes to will tend to make them more receptive to answering positively to future requests. That initial request may be a small, may be a small donation. This is one of the reasons why um, special events tend to be so effective as mechanisms for bringing in new donors, because there's a, there's a low bar to entry, there's, there's you know, low threat level, the amount being asked is relatively low, um, but it allows you to talk to them thereafter as prospective donors. You can also get them doing you know, sim simpler things. One of the things I did to the campaign that I did with Marianopolis College, as much as possible, I tried to get major prospects to come and visit the site where the college was going to be located after it moved and to tour the new building. What that does, yes, it gets them on site and seeing the place, but it also means that they have to give up their time and do something that is relatively inconvenient before they've done anything else. So this doesn't cost them any money. I haven't asked them to, to give anything, but they have done something that will tend to lead them to be more receptive to future requests. It's a small thing to ask them for, but asking somebody for something small first will tend to lead to them being more receptive to doing something greater in the future because of that notion of consistency. So, you want to try and apply as many of those six elements of influence as possible in every solicitation situation. I try to build in all six, even in a, even in a solicitation letter uh, for a direct mail campaign, I will try and build in all six of them somehow. You know, I will talk about the organization's authority. I will always open by saying, if they were a donor in the past, um, you know, which most of the people we, you know, you're going to solicit that are on your donor base, they've been donors in the past, I will say to them, you know, I will make a point of making specific reference to their previous giving. Um, you know, I'll talk about the organization's authority. I'll talk about how many people have supported this, uh, this particular cause that we're planning on social proof. Uh, I will put some kind of a deadline into the letter so that for compressing time, making it more scarce. Uh, you know, all of these things, liking is a little bit harder to do in a direct mail piece, but very easy to do in a face-to-face in -a -face solicitation, simply by letting people talk to them about themselves. So you want to try and you know, use as many of these techniques as possible in your, in your own solicitation.